Whenever I talk about powerful old strategies, people ask me, well, DZ, how do these decks stand up against the new school Yu-Gi-Oh decks, or how do they stand up against decks even like one year after they came out? Now, I haven't answered these questions in a video because personally, I'm not a big fan of what if questions. I don't really like them because we don't really have any data to go off of. When we're looking at historical context, it's cool to look at how good a deck was relative to the other decks of its format, and that's sort of how we can formulate our opinion opinions about how strong the strategy is. In today's video then, I'm going to talk about the challenges that arise when you compare broken decks versus other broken decks from different eras, especially if you have them play against each other. And I do want to mention at the very, very beginning of this video, this is not taking shots at any other Yugi tours out there that do this sort of discussion. I think that these discussions are worth having. I'm personally just not super interested in them. If you are interested in them, make sure you check out Lithium's channel. I'm sure a lot of people will already be commenting well, DZ hates Lithium. That's not true at all. I actually think he's the best channel out there for cross banlist sort of promotional material. And I say that because he's the one doing the cross banlist cup. And it's a really cool series that he's been doing for years. Basically, he takes top decks and sometimes even rogue decks from different formats throughout Yu Gi Oh's history and then pits them up against many other decks from other formats and other years in the game. Now, I mention this because I don't actually think that series is bad. I don't think it's terrible. I actually think it's a very good if not one of the better series on Yugi tubing just because there's so much work that goes into it and he does a really fantastic job of making both decks have the fairest opportunities but even in those cases I think you could find on Lithium's channel instances where he's sort of mentioning maybe as an aside many of the problems that I'm going to be mentioning in today's video once again I don't think this discussion is bad to have in terms of which deck is the most powerful but there certainly are a lot of hurdles when you start doing that analysis. Anyway though, there are four major issues that I feel have to come up every single time you pit two of the best decks against each other, even if you're just discussing them, I think especially when they're playing against each other. So the first thing is hindsight. Now hindsight is really, really big in Yu-Gi-Oh! Because oftentimes when we look at older decks, no matter how far away from them we are, even sometimes just a year after they came out, people sort of learn new things. Maybe a new tech arise that was available in that older card pool that people didn't know about. So then you have to make the decision. Do you go off of the tournament topping deck list or with the hindsight knowledge that you now know, do you add the cards that you now know are very good to those decks to make them even better? There are a ton of examples of this. I think the biggest one that a lot of people think of and sort of agree to sort of just ignore is Solemn Judgment in GOAT format. Now back in GOAT format, people didn't play Solemn Judgment in basically every single deck. However, the card is very, very good and people eventually found out the card is very good. So when you play GOAT format, you have to ask yourself, well, do I play Solemn Judgment in my deck? It's at three in that format, and you'll probably win a ton of matches with it, but most people have agreed to just not play the card because it's sort of just a hindsight issue. Another example of this is Vanity's Emptiness, a card that went up to $40 for the one common copy back in 2014, and it's a card that many people just slept on. For years, people did not play Vanity's Emptiness. It popped up every once in a while. I mean, it was in several Dragon Ruler 2013 deck lists and it was in some stun deck lists, but overall people really didn't understand how good Vanity's Emptiness was until the latter half of 2014. So anytime that you build a deck after Vanity's Emptiness came out before 2014, you have to ask yourself, well, is it fair to include Vanity's Emptiness in the deck? And I think most people agree that it's not fair, but once again, it's just an issue of hindsight. The other issue is card pools. Many of the best decks of sort of five years ago or 10 years ago were only good because of a more limited card pool, especially in the case where direct counters are made to meta decks years after they were meta. For example, when we play Shadals or Necros, two of the best decks from 2015 or even Pepe from 2016, we have to ask ourselves, well, when you let them play against newer decks, do those newer decks get an opportunity to play Dimensional Barrier? Now, 
dimensional barrier is pretty much a hard counter to all three of these extremely powerful strategies and when they were topping events and winning events and taking all the top cut seats people didn't have access to dimensional barrier it simply wasn't a card so when the newer decks play against them if those newer decks weren't necessarily main decking or side decking dimensional barrier do you let them use that card because technically it was a card they had access to and especially in the case of d barrier i think of it's not so much a hindsight issue because many players were side decking that card and i think side decking just in general is sort of a messy subject with these comparisons of broken decks a lot of these side deck cards that people used to play aren't good anymore and vice versa many of the cards that you would play now wouldn't be so good against those older strategies but i think dimensional barrier in particular really comes up a lot the other big issue as far as card pools go is hand traps so when you look at these older strategies even the ones when Yu-Gi-Oh started to get a little bit more fast like 20 or 2009 2010 2011 there weren't that many hand traps around you had dd crow you had effect failure eventually you had max c but overall nothing on the same level of what we see nowadays you didn't have ash boss you didn't have like ghost bell and ghost ogre when we think of 2018 and 2019 Yu Gi Oh decks they have to be prepared to play through ash blossom and ghost ogre and all these cards out there and that really means that the competitive decks are able to deal with these hand traps a lot better than the competitive decks from just five years prior things like ash blossom counter all of the necroz cards basically i mean baryonic and all of those cards manju senju all the main power plays in that deck are countered by ash blossom which we've kind of seen now that necroz cards are mostly unbanned you still have one unicorn one trip but many of the other cards have come off the ban list and it isn't performing that well competitively even though it has the new support of the incantations it's just not consistent enough and it's not able to push through hand traps like other decks out there so it's really hard to say when you let those newer decks that almost certainly were main decking things like ash blossom play against those older decks or the ones even from five years prior when they didn't have ash blossom and didn't have to deal with that card how is that a fair fight when one deck gets to use such a powerful generic card and the other deck doesn't i don't think there's a debate about whether or not you should let those older decks have access to ash blossom i think most people agree that they shouldn't be able to use the card it simply didn't exist back then but i also think it creates a power imbalance between the newer decks and the older decks not even just looking at the archetype cards when we see things like ash blossom in every single person's deck it's a card that counters many of the really powerful cards back five years ago things like should all fusion and necroz of Brionic and preparation of rights these cards when they were at their sort of full power capabilities didn't have to deal with a card from your opponent's hand just negating them instantly the third big challenge that i feel happens when you compare these broken decks is one that comes up all the time when people compare usually zodiacs and performa pal pendulums now to many people these are the two best decks in the game's history dragon lords also sort of end up there but i think as far as modern yu-yo goes people compare those two decks the most because they were so dominant in their respective formats and in the case of performa pal pendulums they actually had konami be forced to make an emergency ban list however the third issue is that many players when comparing these decks which by the way i feel is probably the right call do not account for matchup adaptation now what i mean by this is that when you look at a format and there's like five ycs's throughout that format even if you don't have a ban list in there people change their tech options people grow and they learn the different matchups and learn different side deck options so over those five ycs's even if you have roughly the same meta game maybe one deck changes some things so they can combat the other matchups better so when you look at things like pepe versus zodiacs do zodiacs now have access to cards that are really good against pepe even if they weren't playing them in their topping builds it's kind of interesting to think about that because when you discuss those two decks power level i feel like you sort of have to acknowledge the fact that players don't have to be locked into playing those decks the way that they were played back when mirror matches were more, were more prominent for example at the end of zoo format the like third zoo format there are so many formats with zodiacs being the top deck a lot of players were main decking cards like my body as a shield just because that card is very good against zodiac dryant so when you sort of take those topping lists those winning lists that were playing zodiacs and you play them against perform pal pendulums well do you force these zodiac players to play my body as a shield even though if they were thinking of the matchup they wouldn't play that card this is sort of the issue that even when you let both players use whatever card pools they had for those decks during their respective formats you have to make a decision somewhere where how much do you let each deck sort of tailor themselves for the matchup and actually just as a quick aside this is one of the areas 
case where I see lithium have a lot of issues, not anything necessarily his fault, but when you look at those top lists and you play them against other top lists, a lot of times those first place lists actually do have main deck tech for the metagame. I think he's struggled in the past to sort of figure out where to draw the line in terms of what cards to make them keep and what cards to let them cut. And lastly, at number four for these challenges that affect players that are comparing broken strategies in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, I've put this at the end because I think right now it's the least important, but I think as time goes on, it'll become the most important thing on this list. But I want to put it at the end because I don't think it's actually that big of a deal at the moment. And that's that links kind of mess up everything about the Across Bandless Cup. Now, I don't even know if there's a function in Yu-Gi-Oh Pro to let one player use links and one player not use links. On Dueling Book, you could do that, but as far as Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro goes, I mean, it's a little bit difficult, right? Because you either have the extra monster zones or you don't. I don't think there's an option to sort of switch it up in between one player having links and one player not having links. There are a ton of issues with just link summoning in general, and it doesn't really come down to the arrows themselves. I mean, yes, that does factor, but I think of like Goki. When Goki was a top deck, the reason it was a top deck, or one of the reasons it was a top deck, was because not only was it comboing off, making this big board, but that big board restricted you from summoning any monsters from your extra deck because it made an extra link. So when you have Goki versus the older decks, do you let extra links affect your opponent's ability to summon from the extra deck? Because when they're playing their normal combos, like when they go first, they don't have to care about link zones at all. But now do you change it so that when they go second, they suddenly do have to care about link zones? Like I said, I think this is not the biggest issue right now because we've only had link summoning for one year. But I think going forward, like five years from now, assuming link summoning stays around, which it probably will, I think this is the biggest issue going forward just because how do you compare the power levels of Link Summoning cards and Link Summoning decks versus these older decks that don't even care about extra monster zones at all? Never mind the fact that we are getting more and more arrows that affect the board and affect your opponent's ability to do things. How do you really balance the Link decks where their balance comes from the fact that their arrows suck? Things like Sky Strikers, the whole point of that deck or one of the ways that it's balanced is that it can only summon one monster at a time for the most part and then it gives your opponent a free extra monster zone to summon things to i guess it's not technically an extra monster zone but they can still summon something from the extra deck to where your monster points however when you play against those older decks they don't really care about that so one of the sort of downsides of the sky striker deck doesn't actually come into play i think this is a pretty big issue heading forward and i'm curious to see how lithium deals with it in the coming years Anyway, though, hope you guys enjoyed today's discussion video on comparing broken Yu Gi Oh decks and the four biggest problems, in my opinion, when you do that. I'll see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.